interesting. I'll have to tell. I'll have to tell Pastor Greg I'm the president of Elam Life. <laughs> no, 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 no. Pastor Greg and Pastor Melanie are are it. Amen. I miss them, and I'm uh, very encouraged. My wife and I. I was. Uh, just realizing this morning that when we left Bible College here at Elam Bible Institute and went over to uh, South Butler, that was the first church that we became members. And then we came back over here and we attended this church. And part of my responsibility is to visit all kinds of churches, Elam churches and otherwise. But uh, we, we considered this church our home church, but we officially became members. So I've only been a member of two churches, the church we pastored and this church. And I'm excited. And I love this church. Amen? I'm excited about what uh, I've seen God do. My wife is in the front row. You're going to want to know that when I get into my message because you'll start praying for her diligently as we go forward. But anyway... Uh, I just want to jump right in and uh, just say how much I deeply appreciate this congregation. I'm aware that um, you uh, prayed for me in particular in the beginning of the year. Um, I had open heart surgery. I had open heart surgery um, on the 31st of August, 2018. Uh, they did a double bypass and then um, uh, I thought I was doing good, but I really had pain from that day until... Uh, recently, uh, and uh, they found out in this particular surgery uh, that there was a mistake, and uh, the sternum had not come together. And so, um, not only was I hurting through uh, the valve that was not working correctly, but I also my sternum was rubbing like this, and uh, and so they had to do what they called a redo, and they recharged me as well. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, on January 13th, I literally am, am so, so encouraged. Um, what happened was um, in the uh, surgery August 2018, I hurt and couldn't stand up by myself for at least uh, six to eight weeks. Um, the day after the surgery on July 13th of this year, where they replaced the valve, they cut me open again, cleaned it up a little bit, and uh, put me all back together. I was able to stand up all by myself the second day. How's that? Amen. Praise God. And, um, and I haven't had pain in my chest at all since the third or fourth day of surgery. So God is so good. Amen? So I'm glad they redid me. I'm glad they redid me. And, uh, but I said all that to say I know that you know, at the end of the day, they have good doctors. I had good doctors. Um, but at the end of the day, I know it's because people just like you prayed for me. And I just want to thank you so much. And I'm very, very grateful to this church. So um, I've been watching, uh, been coming to this church. We, in fact, we came a lot right after the surgery because I wasn't traveling. And we're here quite a bit at the beginning of this year. But I try to get here at least once a month, depending on... Uh, my schedule or Carol's schedule because she travels as well speaks in churches and moves in prophetic ministry and has her ministry as well and so depending on where we're at a couple of weeks ago I, I drove while well, she spoke at a church out in Oneida, New York and, uh, but I've been watching this church and I've been you know, connected very closely with your pastor and uh, we love each other and uh, we just are on several committees together, but he's become a good friend of mine, and I just am so grateful. But one of the things I've noticed is God has been already beginning to do in this church what I really want to speak to this morning, because I, I, I can't say he's doing that everywhere, but I've clearly seen uh, what God is doing, and that's he's adding to the church. He is he is adding in, in ways that are absolutely amazing, not just by bringing more people to the church, different people, but he's adding uh, a dimension of himself. He's, uh, there's, there's, if you will, uh, a divine addition. And that's the title of my message this morning. I want to talk to you a little bit about the divine addition. It says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, that uh, I'm just going to paraphrase it because I'm not preaching from that, but it says that Paul watered, I mean, excuse me, planted, and Apollos watered, 
but God caused, what is it? The increase. Say that with me, the increase. You didn't say it loud enough? Go ahead. The increase. And so I could even hear it online that time. So welcome online people. I'm just excited that you're here as well. I even uh, emailed a bunch of people this morning to tell them to listen to me. So hopefully they're on. And if not, later on, I will yell at them. Okay, moving on. But, but, but I want to I wanna talk to you about... Um, when I started preparing for this message, and it was a while ago now, uh, as I was preparing this message, I, I said, Lord, what is the greatest illustration in your word of a divine addition? What is, what is it that is like a real cool divine addition? And I, I, came, I came to the conclusion that the best divine addition was when God sent his son to this world, amen? He divinely added for a season a expression of himself, an exact representation of who he was in the flesh, Jesus Christ, and he divinely added him to the culture that changed everything. Amen? It changed everything we, as, as a result of that divine addition. And whenever God brings a divine addition to our lives personally or a church, in fact, I want you to receive this message this morning as not just a message for this church, but for a message for us individually. And, and you'll, you'll see it as I go along. But, but God divinely added Jesus Christ, if you will, the expression of the Godhead. He was already in, the Trinity was already present, but he became a manifest presence of addition to the society. Now, John the Baptist by that time was already baptizing, preaching, and had his own disciples. And um, his disciples got a little frustrated when this new addition came along. In fact, it, the, the scripture says that they began to dispute with the Jews and other people, and then they began to ask questions. Who is this new dude on the, tra on, on the trail? Now, they didn't say those words, obviously, but this, the, 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 the spirit of the text is they're concerned about a guy that's taking over John the Baptist's job. That's his last name for crying out loud. Why is he baptizing? You know what I mean? And, uh, and so they began to, to express their frustration. Better than that, let me just read the text so you can see it for yourselves. John chapter 3, verses 22 through 30. Now after these things, after Jesus came, after Jesus was baptized by John. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now he's starting to baptize. Now John also was baptizing in Anion near Salim, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Now, there arose this dispute between some of John's disciples, now these are John's disciples, and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Hey, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, this is how they're saying it. Come on now. He's baptizing, and all are coming to him. What's this all about? John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I have said I am not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. He who, is the, who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. And then the verse that many of you would know, and if you don't, this is a good one to know. It says this, he must increase, but I must decrease. Amen? He must increase, <clears throat> but I must decrease. If divine addition, which I believe it is, already started in this house, is happening to, e, uh, to ELC, and also to you as an individual, I believe God is positioning us right now to be a better expression of the church in 2024 than what we were in 2020. In 2020, we got all upset over 
masks. Remember that? But in 2024, I think a, it's a prominent time for churches to step up and be counted. It's a time for us to be able to say, let us be a positive expression to the world. A, 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 an expression that people would want to join, not just run away from, but an expression. And in order for that to happen, I believe a divine addition must come to the church. Now, when a divine addition comes, there's four lessons I learned from John's sermon to his disciples that I just read to you. The first lesson is this. It's found in verse 27. He said, in response to their complaining about Jesus coming on the scene, they said this. A man, he said this. A man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. First lesson, I must know, and you must know, I must know that what I have must come from heaven. If, 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 I'm, gonna, if I'm gonna be strong and I'm gonna be confident in my role as a human being who loves Jesus and is a follower of Christ, I gotta know that what God's doing in my life comes from heaven. And that what he's doing in your life comes from heaven. Are you with me? Because if I'm just doing things as a church member or as, or as a person uh, who's a follower of Christ, and I'm just doing it because I've got a gift and I've got a talent and I can sing and I can do that. But if God has not called me to do it, if God has not given it to me and I don't value the gift that he's given to me, then I will be the one to defend it when it's attacked rather than him defending the call of God on my life. I must know that what I have comes from heaven. The problem today is we have so many choices because of the world we live in. Back in the day when I, um, you know, got into ministry, started being a part of a church and acting, uh, you know, as a part of a church family, discovering my gifts and discovering my talents, I didn't have the whole world teaching me through the means of the internet of all the options that are available to me. And I think one of the, the difficulties that's happened over that is we have so many options, we forget to listen for his option. What is he saying to us? What is he calling us to? A guy named Mark Sayers from uh, uh, Australia says this, <clears throat> leaders do not choose, they rather respond to God's choosing. I like that. Our responsibility is to relinquish life of its many options so that we can receive one, God's one option. As, as, as I, I believe God is adding to your life and my life, as he's adding to this church's life, as he's gonna continue to bring increase to our lives, to this church's life, to the attendance of this church, to the things that this church will impact, as that divine increase will continue to go forward we need to say, God, what are you calling me to do? What are you saying to me? I want your option, not the options that I continue to choose where I haven't even talked to you about it. Does that make sense? I think that's what John the Baptist was saying. Listen, Jesus knows what he's called to do, and I know what I'm called to do. I'm in. I got it. I know what I have comes from heaven. We need to know in the day we live what we have and what we are called to, and even where we're called to be, is God's decision. That really helped me when I was a pastor in that little church in South Butler, New York. South Butler, we were there, Carol and I were there. The population of that community was 127 people, 5,000 cows. And, uh, and we, we pastored that church. There were 24 people that were members. Uh, 36 people came to see the new guy who was preaching that day, when the first day we got there. There were 24 people on the board. That'll kill you right there, right there. <laughs> 24 people on the board with the, 20, uh, the 36 uh, people in the church, yeah. All you have to do is do something and you were asked to be a member of the board. And they never taught me how to do all that stuff at, uh, at Elam, they only taught me the Bible. But uh, anyway, that's another point that's coming up. Here, here's the deal, when we went there though, we knew God called us. It was a desolate place. My friend Stacy Klein said to me, he said, um, you gotta know your call to that place so that when it gets more difficult, 
You'll, you, you won't be doing it because of the fruit that you have yet to see, but you're doing it on the basis of the calling of God in your life. So maybe you're doing a home group right now, or maybe you're going to be doing a home group, and you haven't seen the fruit. You need to know that God called you to it so that you can stay in the game, not because of the fruit that you see, but because of the voice you listen to. Number one, I must know what I have must come from God. Number two, verse 28, John continues his sermon to his disciples, and he says, hey, you yourselves bear witness that I have said. From the very beginning, John said this. He said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. Second lesson. First lesson, that I must know that what I have comes from God. Second lesson is I must know who I am and who I'm not. You got to know who you are and who you're not. Just imagine all of a sudden, if all of a sudden, 300 people were added to this church. This is a pretty big church. But 300 next Sunday show up. And they start showing up. And they're sitting where you're sitting right now. Well, that already will irritate you right there. <laughs> are you with me? So all of a sudden, they've taken your pew or whatever it is, the bench. And, and, and so all of a sudden, you have to understand, you got to know who you are. We'll have more worship team people than you ever dreamed. We'll have sound people more than you. But that'll tick you off because they took your place. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And that's what the disciples were feeling. The, the disciples of John were feeling, who is this guy up here baptizing? It, this don't make sense to me. I thought you were the Baptist. John said, listen, from the very beginning, I told you, I, I'm just a forerunner. I'm just pointing to this guy. He's the Christ. When I, when I went to the church there, I was kind of insecure. I'm still insecure. It's just a matter of how much I'm insecure. Are you with me? But I was insecure about who I was enough to know that I needed help. So back in the day when, uh, when hardly anybody knew him, I, I discovered from a conference I went to um, a guy named John Maxwell. Now Nowadays, people know him and... Uh, and, you know, he costs $46,000 for one hour to speak. So he's a little more known. And, uh, but at the end of the day, they're paying me that here today. But, but moving on. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, they're laughing. Okay. Um, but, but John Maxwell became really close to my wife and I. He, he, um, uh, God really just started building a relationship with him. And I, and, uh, I didn't know how to lead a board. You know, 24 people on a board for crying out loud. Nobody knows how to leave that. And then I didn't know how to receive an offering. I didn't know how to do the leadership stuff. And John was like giving me gold in my heart. The only thing that became a problem, though, is anytime I preached a sermon, I sounded just like John Maxwell. I started becoming a miniature John Maxwell on Sunday mornings because I loved everything I was learning. I was even preaching his sermons because you didn't have the internet to check me out back then. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and I was really enjoying preaching. And, and, uh, and then a little bit longer after that, God really, which my wife was very excited about this, I started connecting with somebody who was more spirit-filled, Jack Hayford. And uh, so I would go out to California to connect with Pastor Jack. And next thing you know, I don't know why, he started uh, connecting with us, we brought him here to this platform right here for our conference, and then I took him over to Syracuse where we lived, and and uh, Jack started liking Carol and I, and he asked Carol to lead worship for him on a tour, and they paid our expenses to go to Israel, and he's about six foot eight, and and not really, but he's tall, and uh, and and I used to, I became a good Jack Hayford. Short Jack Hayford every Sunday morning. The Holy Spirit. I mean, I used to hold my hand just like this. You know what I mean? The way he would do and, 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 and everything. But here's what I'm leading up to. Somewhere along the line, around 10 years into my ministry, God said to me one day, okay, when are you going to be finished being John and Jack and be Chris? When are you going to know what you're called to do and what you're not called to do? I don't need John and I don't need Jack in South Butler. I need Chris and Carol Ball. Are you hearing me? And so I started preaching 
out of who I was, and I started talking out of who I was, and all of a sudden, I'm doing what I'm called to do, and we saw our church go from 24, 34, 44, 104, 204, 350, all the way up to 520. Boom, just like that. You see, God can bring an increase when you know what you're called to do and when you're not, uh, know who you are and when you know who, who you're not. Are you hearing what I'm saying? When you know who you are and when you, we know who you're not. Number three, third lesson. Number one, say it if you think it out loud. I must know what I have must come from God. Number two, I must know who I am and who I'm not. Number three, I almost jumped ahead on it. Here it is. Verse 29. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom stands with the bridegroom and hears his voice. Third lesson. When God brings divine increase to ELC, to your life, third lesson. I must know what I'm called to do and what I'm not called to do. That's different than knowing who you are. Got to start with knowing who you are and who you're not. I'm not John. I'm not Jack. I'm Chris. Got to know that. Got to know that what I have comes from God. Now, with what I have and knowing who I am, what am I called to do? John the Baptist says, Jesus, he's the bride. I'm the best man. That's what he says. I'm the best man. And when the best man standing there... John the Baptist hears the voice of the bridegroom saying, I love my church. It just brings the greatest joy for me. All you got to do, JB, is stand and be the best man. And I'm thrilled with that. That's what he says right there. I just read it, verse 29. You got to know what you're called to do. When God begins to bring more and more people into this church, people who we need in this church, people that God needs to uh, bring into Christ, people who need to get saved, people who need to get born again, people who need to join with us in this church, when he starts to do that, you better know who you are and who you're not, but you better also know what you're called to do and what you're not called to do. I've never in all my life gone to the dentist and sat down in a chair and tried to tell the dentist how to do a root canal. Last night, I looked it up on the internet, and I figured out how to do the root canal better. Why don't you do this? This is how you do it. I just looked it up on it. We have more people today tell pastors how to do church that never even studied in a Bible school. I think that we can help one another. Don't get me wrong. But so much, we need to know what we're called to do and what we're not called to do. Let me, let me illustrate it better. When Carol and I were in uh, South Butler, we went to this little church. It was called the Disciples of Christ Church. It was a denominational church. 77 pastors before me. The church was birthed in 1831, and it didn't change very much. Carol and I were told by Elma Frink, who pastored that church in 1974, that the elders of that church are the ones in charge and no pastor is allowed to do communion. So no pastor had done communion in that church. When we walked into that church, they taught me how to walk down the middle aisle, light candles, and then come up to the front, kneel down, and I think it's called genuflecting, and then go up and sit in the big throne chairs and act like I'm praying. I mean praying. You know what I'm saying? That's what we learned. But we loved the people. We cared about the people. We wanted to be there. So slowly, my wife, who knows how to lead worship, she's got an amazing spirit of worship, just like these folks were today. And uh, I leaned over to her. I said, did you sense the presence in their leadership? And she said, yes. But my wife now is going to teach this church that only played three hymns with an organ and lit candles, how to follow a guitar. So she's singing, what a mighty God we serve. You remember that? Come on. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. 
heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God. We... Well, you got your fix for doing an oldie. There you go. All right. So, so here's what we do. She started doing that, right? So, and then as the deer and all that, right? And, and she's teaching this church a new style of worship with her gifts that God called her to. You got it? Now, on the way home from church on Sunday, we had a seven-minute ride. And this was the first question usually asked. How did I do, honey? Did I preach good today? And, of course, her answer was always, of course you did. It was wonderful. And then she said, what do you think about worship? And I said, well, I thought it was good, too. But then I said that small little word, but. If I were you, I wouldn't sing as the deer 10 times through. I think five is sufficient. <laughs> and I think what a mighty God we serve could have been a little bit faster. We had intense fellowship for the next six minutes. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, you would have thought I said something wrong. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's given me a, a break, you know. I mean, it's like, wow. But see, that happened because she didn't listen to me the first time. I had to do that every week until she gets it. And, and intense fellowship got more intense. Are, are, you, are you hearing me? And uh, so Carol and I submitted to the elders of the church. We said, let's, let's bring this to the elders because obviously you don't see me as the head of the house. And, um, and, uh, and I am the priest of the church here. Come on, you know, what's the deal here? And so we submitted to the elders of our church, and the elders of our church said to us, um, we agree with Carol, which means that I will never go to the elders for counseling for my marriage <laughs> at all, ever again. I mean, it's ridiculous. They just like her better because she cried. And, uh, and, and I, I understand, you know, that's the way it goes sometimes, you know. But... Uh, uh, I told my wife, I said, well, you know, let's go to a professional counselor, somebody that doesn't know us, because when we go to a counselor, we always agreed if we go to a counselor, then we will listen to what they say and, and, and you know, just take it at face value. And, and you need counseling and therapy anyway, so let's go. <laughs> and because uh, anybody who lived with me needed therapy, I'm telling you that right now. Okay, so we went, right? We went to counseling, and uh, the counselor said, oh, I, I, I know exactly what to tell you. So I'm waiting for him to, excuse me, her, which is a little unfair, but moving on. Uh, I was waiting for her, to, the counselor, to tell us and tell Carol how much she really just needed to submit, you know. And, uh, and the counselor said, well, what I think is really the problem is, Chris, you're trying to be the Holy Spirit for your wife. In fact, here's really how practical it was. She said, Chris, what you need to do is realize what you're called to do and what you're not called to do. Well, let me say it the way she said it. You're supposed to stay in this lane, and she's supposed to have that lane. And then here's the key. But you can't go into her lane unless she invites you into that lane. Oh, that'll save some of your marriages right there. I'm telling you that right now. And it saved how I handled the people in my church, even though I was in a position of leadership. Just because I was the title senior pastor didn't mean that I lorded over people, that I began to maneuver people. I needed to say, would you mind if I, see, it didn't even occur to me to ask, do you mind if I speak an idea for you? I just told her what she needed to change. Disrespected her completely. Let me tell you something. She didn't invite me into that lane very much for a while. But when she did, I jumped in. And I said, yeah, I think that you should do X, Y, Z. And she goes, okay, well, I'm not going to. See, trust has to be earned in leadership. Trust has to be earned in lanes. And so... We need to understand what we're called to do and what we're not called to do. You hear me? I obviously believe that the leadership of this church is called to, to generally lead the whole church, the elders and the pastors. But 
letting people be released in the power of the Holy Spirit working in their zone and in their lane is the best. So when people start sitting in your pews, start picking up the bass guitar and playing good like you, start running sound, start doing children's ministry, you got to ask them this question. Do you really know that what you have comes from God? Do you really know who you are and who you're not? And then do you know what you're called to do? And watch this, and what you're not called to do. You don't want me to leave worship. I'm telling you right now, you do not want me to leave worship. Are you hearing me? You need to know what you're called to do. Let me give you the last one. Everybody quoted this verse. He must increase, and I must decrease. Now, when I read this verse, I said, Lord, show me something that you're saying here. And all the years that I've quoted that verse and known that verse, I knew that verse as much as John 3.16. I mean, you know what? I didn't know where it was until I started studying this word because you just read the Bible or hear the Bible or sing the Bible and sometimes don't know exactly where it is. But in this context, John is saying to his disciples, listen, guys, listen, Jesus is the deal, man, and he's called to do this. I'm called to do this. He knows what he's got comes from heaven. I know what I've got comes from heaven. You need to know that too. And he said, you know what he's called to do and he knows who he is, all that. He said, but here's the key to everything. He must increase and I must decrease. And the Lord showed me this. Not, say, I, I, this is how I listen to this, this, this verse. I, I listen to it this way. He must increase, like he's increasing in the whole world. He's increasing in every capacity. Watch this, and this is what I followed it with, and I must decrease and become nothing. Little me, nothing. God said, I didn't ask you to be nothing. I just asked you to decrease. He said, here's, this is how he said it to me. To me. He said, Chris, I want to increase in you. I, w- I, want, I want the e- increase to come in you. So that that happens, you have to decrease to make room for me to come into you. And if, if so, then I will, I will begin to show you how to know who you are and who you're not. I will begin to show you how and what you're called to and what you're not called to. You see, see what I'm saying? But it starts with me coming inside because I'm going to call you to things that requires you to decrease and let me increase in you. I'm going to call and ask you to do things that needs to be in, increased of me and decreased in you, of yourself. Are you hearing me? So I started on a journey and said, well, well, what areas, God, do I need to have an increase of you? Now, I already spoke a word about community in this church. The last time I preached here, I preached on the community, the future of the church. I don't want to hammer this again because this is important for us as a church today in the world we live in. This is what God said to me. Now, a lot of these people over here know me because some of them work for me, have worked for me and quit. <clears throat> and, uh, but here's the deal. They know I love people. But God said to me, I want to increase your love for people by letting my love come in you and your love be decreased. I went, what are you talking about, God? I love people. And he began to point out to me the people he loved, I ignored. He, he began to point out to me the people he loved that I avoided. The people that I didn't reach out to. I didn't even see it until this. This message started working in me and I began to start hearing God say, how about talking to that person? You usually avoid that person. It's changed my Starbucks experience. Do you know what? When I was in the hospital, I determined that every person that came in my room, I would thank them. People ignore them. They're paid for this. I was the favorite on the floor just by being loving and caring for the people who cleaned up my mess. Are you hearing me? God would have done that. Lazarus, the Pharisee, ignored this woman. And Jesus comes along and says, I died for that woman. 
And she was so grateful she washed his feet with her hair. The first thing we have to do is say, or we don't have to do, I have to do, is let his love increase in me. The second thing, you're going to like this. He said, Chris, I, I li I'd like to increase my love. You decrease your love. How about this? He wants to increase his listening capability in me. Now, if you ask my wife, she'll say, thank you, Jesus. Because I have selective li listening. Are you with me? Called selective hearing, right? Carol knows I can be listening to 25 people, and then she has to get other people to say what she just said 10 times, so I listen. Are you with me? It's just, I don't have the, there's never a time you or I approach God and he doesn't listen. Never. He's listening right now to what you're thinking. Every one of us. And God said, you're quick to give answers without even listening. You're quick to tell people what you've learned over 30 years without listening for five seconds to find out what really you need to say. And it's begun to change my life because I want to be able to have deeper listening in my life. And the only way that happens is for him to increase and me to decrease. Let me give you one more. I have 10, but I'm not going to spill my guts everywhere. This one is increased learning. Hey, Chris, I want you to increase how you learn. Learn like I did. I was a young boy. I had to learn. I lived and I grew up in the wisdom and stature and, and favor with both men and God. I understood what it means to listen. And let me increase in you how to learn. And I said, well, how, how do you do that, God? I want to learn from you, not just from books about you. That's what he started to teach me. And he said, well... It says in Proverbs 1, 5, let the wise man hear, starts with that listening, and then he will increase in learning. Take my yoke upon, me, upon you and learn from me. In other words, if you want to learn how to learn from me, stop learning to fulfill your yoke. Exchange yokes with me and you'll have a whole new lesson plan. Isn't that cool? Last one, I will give you one more because you all are nice. But these are my life. This is my life over the last two years, just saying, God, what do you want to change in my life? Increase his leadership within me. His leadership is a lot different than my leadership or your leadership. He does everything different than me sometimes. Not everything, because I've learned a few things. But he said, increase. John Maxwell wrote a book called Developing the Leader within you. And then he followed it with a book called Developing the Leader Around You. But he starts with, he said, if you want to start, develop. So I was telling God about this book. And God said, well, let me, let me give you a deeper plan of how to lead. And this is what he said to me. Instead of developing the leader within you, just this one word changed everything. Awaken the leader within you. In other words, the leader, that's, the leader that's the best leader in the whole world, that people are still following his leadership for today for 2,000 years. It's pretty good leadership, right? I, but he's got a bestseller. Okay? That leader is in you. It's in you. And he says, awaken that leader in you so that he could lead through you rather than you telling him how to lead. Oh, it changes. it's changing my leadership style. In other words, I pray a lot more. Here's, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get ready because I believe with all my heart that God wants to bring a divine addition to your life and to this church. Now, when I heard God say that, I said, well, God, I like multiplication. And he said, well, my addition is better than your multiplication. But I believe God wants to bring additional leader. He wants to increase into your life. He wants to, he wants to bring addition to your life. And I believe God sent me here this morning. I'm so honored to be here, by the way. I don't just take it for granted that I got invited because of my position. 
I'm here because I believe God said today he wants to tell this church, get ready. It's a time for divine addition. And we need to be, I didn't say you, we need to be ready and prepared, number one, to know that what we have comes from God. Number two, know who we are and who we're not. Don't try to be somebody else. What's your name? Say it again. Desiree, let me tell you something. When God made you Desiree, this is what he said to you about you. I'll never do that again because it's perfect the first time. I will never need to do another Desiree just like this Desiree. I've been thinking about it for years and he made you. And he could say that to any of you, not just Desiree. You gotta know who you are and who you're not. You gotta know what you're called to and what you're not called to do. And then finally, you gotta let his increase come into your life. Would you stand with me, please? Here's, 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 here's what I'm going to ask you to pray about. And that is this. I did my homework. This is a sermon. I hope it inspired you. I hope you laughed. I hope you prayed for my wife. <laughs> but at the end of the day, yeah, somebody said always for those on TV, they always pray for her knowing that she is married to this man. But here's what I, I felt like the Lord said to me is don't just take it as an altar call moment but take a moment here to say will I commit to go down the journey to see what God wants to increase of himself in me that if you walk out of here today saying hey that was fun that was good he's good looking <laughs> that won't impress but if you go out of here today and say hey God what do you want to do in me? What do you want to increase in me of yourself? What do you want me to do to decrease? If you do that, just start today. Start tomorrow in the shower. But ask God, what's next for me? I want to be ready for your divine addition. Father, I just pray right now. I pray right now that across this room and on the, online that we would all be inspired today of how awesome it is that you never made a mistake when you made us. But you did make us to grow. You planted us in our mother's wombs. You created us as a human being after your image. You've allowed some of us, if not all of us, to meet your son and change our lives. But now we want to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Come and increase yourself in us as we decrease ourselves. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much, Pastor Chris. You know, we were served good spiritual food today to set us up for this week to live for the Lord and see him increase in our lives. How many of you want Jesus increase in your life to the fullest? Yeah. I want to ask our ministry team if you could come to the front. We have a ministry team here that is available on Sundays to pray with you. They're here to join with you with things you're going through in your life or maybe someone that you have in your life you want to pray for. Maybe it's the dealings of God going on in your life. Maybe something this morning in Pastor Chris's message, God dealing with you, pointing out an area, and you're not sure how to navigate that. They want to join with you. Maybe you're just going through something, something happening in your life. We want to encourage you. We want you to go out of here feeling strengthened and encouraged in the Lord. Also, um, before I release you, I want to let you know immediately after the service, for those of you that would like to join in, 
um, we are going to have a prayer and sending time for Brian and Tamara Albert and their family and also Sharon Nicholson if you could just give us a wave over there on Friday this week they're going to be heading to Guatemala on an eight-day mission trip, and so we're going to take some time after I release the service over here on this side to pray for them speak over them as they get ready to head on a plane down to Guatemala to be lights for the Lord and to love on people in that faraway land let me pray for you this morning Lord we thank you for this day thank you for the word of God that you've given us thank you for this message today thank you for the time in your presence Lord it's so easy to take for granted this moment this morning we come together to meet with you and meet with each other be encouraged and fill up on good things as we get ready to live out this week Lord thank you for encouraging us today I pray your blessing upon the people here in the name of Jesus and everybody said amen God bless you as you go today church